We're looking today at lesson 3.11, which is on power, and this is on page 46 of your unit handout, your unit three handout. So we're gonna be doing two things today. We're gonna be defining power and solving problems involving power and also involving efficiency. There's a definition of power, and it's a useful definition. It tells you something. When you think of machines that are powerful, it doesn't just mean that they can do a lot of work. It means they can do it very quickly. And that's what power is related to. Power is defined as the rate at which energy is used or the weight rate at which work is done. So typically speaking, when you're talking about a rate in science, a rate is something that's measured with respect to time. This is what we say mathematically. So the rate at which I spend money might be so many dollars per month, or the rate at which I eat chicken wings on Friday night might be so many chicken wings per hour. But a rate is typically measured with respect to time. If you go on and take calculus, uh, either at the high school level or the post-secondary level, you'll discover that rates do not have to be measured with respect to time, but they almost always are. So power, the symbol for power is capital P, is equal to the work done divided by the time. But since work is change in energy, right? Let's not forget this from earlier on in this unit. Work is change in energy. We can also write power equals change in energy over time. And it turns out, it turns out everyone that this is the formula that appears on your formula sheet and not power equals change in energy over time, but I think it would be better if you thought of it as change in energy over time and not work over time. There, there's a reason for that that we're gonna get into right now. So first of all, the units of power, whether you're thinking about work over time or energy over time, standard units of time are seconds and standard units of either work or energy are joules. So that means that the unit of power is joules per second. And I'm about to tell you what a joule per second can be written as, but one more thing, I want you hopefully to remember that power is joules per second. That's a very, very useful idea. It turns out that the unit of a joule per second is called a watt, named after, I think, Charles Watt. I could be wrong on this guy's first name. It doesn't really matter. But here's, here's the issue I have, and, and I, I really wish this formula that I've highlighted in blue is not the formula that was on your formula sheet. And the reason is the unit of a watt is abbreviated capital W. But capital W is the symbol that we use for work. And in my experience is students confuse things at this point in time. Because we have two W's. We have this W, which is a quantity called work. And by the way, the unit of which is a joule, right? So we have this W floating around in this formula that I've highlighted in blue. And that W stands for a physical quantity of something. That quantity is work. And the unit of work is a joule. On the other hand, this is not a quantity. It's a unit. This is the unit of work. Uh, sorry, you, sorry. See, even there. It's confusing. It's the unit of power. The symbol for power is capital P. The unit for that symbol or that quantity of power is a watt, which is a capital W, but a capital W is also the letter we use for the quantity of work. And it's why there was a, a time a long time ago where this was the formula that was on your formula sheet. And I don't know why Alberta Ed decided to change it, but they did. Okay. For that reason, anytime you see a watt, 
I would just write joules per second. All right? it's, it's, not, it's not a difficult lesson if you can wrap your head around this kind of use of W in two places. So on your formula sheet under momentum and energy, here's your formula for power. You have now learned all of the formulas you're going to learn in this section in physics 20. These two formulas here are physics 30 related. So power is equal to work over time. If you play your cards right and you know that watts, which is the unit of power, are joules per second, you really shouldn't need a formula. You really shouldn't. Let's take a look at some examples. Compare a 60 watt and a 100 watt bulb in terms of the energy used. Well, again, this is power. When you see that symbol of W as a unit, it's power. So I would suggest that you write it and think of it as 60 joules per second. And we also have a 100 watt bulb, which is 100 joules per second. Now, I admit, I'm, I'm thinking here in terms of old school light bulbs, what we would call incandescent light bulbs, which, generally speaking, are very difficult to buy in Canada now, but you can buy them. You, if you know where to go, you can buy them. Um, they are the light bulbs that have that metal filament inside. So this is a diagram of a light bulb. There's a wire inside. It's usually got a, an evacuated, not quite evacuated, but almost fully evacuated glass tube. And what happens is when you connect this light bulb to a battery, you connect one terminal of the battery here, one terminal of the battery here. There's a positive terminal to a battery. There's a negative terminal to the battery. You don't need to know this, but it's a physics 30 thing, and many of you will take physics 30. And what happens is electrons, th this follows a circuit. This wire goes in here and out here, and then it's connected to this side piece. So there's what we would call an electric circuit, and the electrons in that wire, in the filament, are repelled from the negative part of the battery, and they're attracted to the positive part of the battery. I don't know. I'm curious. Is anybody taking Chem 30 right now? I didn't think so. But um, if you take Chemistry 30, how many of you are planning on taking Chemistry 30? You would learn how a battery works. It's called an electrochemical cell. There's an electrical production here due to a chemical process. There's a chemical reaction happening. Anyway, when those electrons are repelled and go through the circuit to the positive terminal, they lose energy. And that energy comes off as light. But if you've ever handled one of these light bulbs before, they're very hot, aren't they? Okay. About 95% heat. They're very inefficient, which is why most governments have said, look, in order to combat global warming and to conserve energy, we're going to go with something that is more efficient, like an LED or a halogen bulb. So you get a bunch of heat and light coming off. And once again, if it's an incandescent bulb, that's what we call these filament bulbs, it's mostly heat, very little light. Well, what does this power mean? It means that every second the bulb operates, there's 60 joules of heat and light produced. So this is 60 joules of heat and light every second. And we can write the same thing for the 100 watt thing. I don't really know that it's necessary, but what else you need to know is that that's the amount of energy being lost by the battery or the potential difference, the voltage, whatever, you know, it could be an outlet in a wall. It could be a handheld generator that you're cranking. That's also the amount of energy lost by the battery. So in a chemical battery, there's only so much chemical energy available. So when you put those four AA batteries 
in the back of your calculator, if you have that kind of calculator, they only have so much energy. And that's why sooner or later they run out because your calculator is consuming it. I don't know what the power rate is. I would say it's less than a watt for sure. It's probably milliwatts. But the bottom line is the longer you run your calculator, the less energy there is available left in your calculator batteries. So sooner or later, you're out of energy. So it's not just 60 joules of energy created every second. It has to come from someplace, and it comes from the battery. Does anybody have any questions about number one? Obviously, the 100-watt bulb would consume and produce more energy, not quite twice as much, but close to twice as much as the 60-watt bulb. So if you do have a rechargeable battery in your calculator, when you run out of the energy because you've used it for such a long period of time, then you plug it back in and it recharges. It stores electrical energy in the cells, but that energy has to come from someplace too, right? All right. Number two, what are the units of power in standard SI units? SI, I'm not going to worry about my pronunciation in French, but it's the système international. It's the system of standard units that about 50 or 60 years ago, the scientific community decided to use, to adopt in science. And what we're talking about here are standard units of kilograms, meters, seconds. By the way, since we're talking a little bit about electricity here, there is also something called a coulomb. And I just I have to say this in case somebody knows different and is going to correct me later. These are the set of standard four units we use in high school physics. If you get to post-secondary, they like to say the Coulomb is not a standard unit, but the amp is. It depends on how you look at it. I think for high school students, this makes more sense. It turns out the Coulomb is the unit of charge. So you're going to learn a lot about charge in physics 30, but an electron has a charge. A proton has a charge. Uh, a Van de Graaff generator, how many of you know what a Van de Graaff generator is? If you look in the back cabinet, maybe if we get some time just for kicks, we can pull one out one day and start playing with it. Uh, this is a Van de Graaff generator, and what happens is through friction, it builds up a, a large negative charge on the dome of it. Um, when I shuffle, and I, again, I'm, I teach physics 30, so I'm trying to kind of plant a few seeds in your head. When I, uh, I'm in my living room and I have shag carpet, I don't, but let's imagine I have shag carpet, and I have socks on and my cat is quietly having a snooze on the couch, and I shuffle my feet across the shag carpet, and then I touch my cat's nose and there's a spark, that's a transfer of charge, and charge is measured in Coulombs. What I'm getting at here is anything you can imagine measuring in science, a joule, a newton, a volt, an amp, an ohm, which is a unit of electrical resistance, anything you can imagine measuring in physics can be written as a, a combination of those units. For example, what is a Newton? This is not what the question is. Well, if you were asked what a Newton is, then what you should probably do is picture in your head or write down a formula that could be used to calculate a force, which is measured in Newtons. So when we use MA to get a force, we get Newtons. But the units of mass are kilograms. And the units of acceleration are meters per second squared. So this is a Newton. Right? And we've talked about this before. If I said another big important unit is a joule, well, how would you decide what a joule is? Well, you can take any equation that would calculate energy. For example, mgh is a way to calculate energy. And everything I'm talking about here is not directly connected to this question necessarily or to power, but it's important. If I take the units of mass, which is a kilogram, times the units of g, which is a meter per second squared, 
times the unit of height, which is another meter, I get that. Are you with me? So anytime you want to know what units are equivalent to, you would choose to look at a formula that has that thing with those units in it. Well, what we're asked for is the units of a watt, right? We want to know what the units of power are. Well, we can look at this formula. Power equals, I just cringe every time I have to write that formula because I don't like it, but power is work over time. And the unit of work is a joule. So units of watts are equal to joules per second, but those are not standard units because the joule is not a standard unit. Uh, I've mentioned this before, and I don't want to put the brakes on here too heavy because we've got to keep moving so we don't lose our focus on this question, but kilograms, meters, seconds, and coulombs are called standard units. Does anybody remember what we've called a newton or a joule? Georgia? It's a derived unit. And sometimes you might see the word defined, but it's derived. It's derived from a bunch of, derived means created out of, derived from a bunch of other units. Well, you know, we've already done a joule up here, but let's imagine you didn't know that. You would say, this is going to be joules per second. What is a joule? Well, I used this formula here to find a joule a second ago, right? This is the formula I used. Did I have to use that formula? Could I not have used E equals one-half mv squared? Well, sure. What is the unit of mass? Kilogram. What is the unit or units of V? Meters per second. But we're squaring it. So it's meters squared per second squared. And I, I really think if you've written exactly down what I've written down, I think you should erase something just because I, I'm a math teacher and I want things to be just tickety-boo. I don't like writing fractions with that slash. You know what I'm talking about? So this top part is a joule. And notice that we used a different formula we didn't use MGH, we used a half MV squared, but we still get a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And then it's over a second. So how do we clean that up? Well, my Math 20 students should know what I would expect you to do. Should. I know sometimes you leave a math class and you go in a different class and you leave the math behind. But how do you clean up? this, which is what I would call a complex fraction. I got to ask somebody. Abby? Right, multiply top and bottom by a second. If you don't know me with regard to this, I hate the concept of multiplying by a reciprocal unless it's with rational expressions that we just learned. Okay, So I would not think of the bottom as seconds over one and flip it over. I would do that, and what happens is, and I guess, you know what, we've got to multiply by a second squared, don't we, to cancel both of those second squares. So this cancels, and we're left with this, you know what, somewhat meaningless statement. Kilogram meter squared per second cubed. That's what a watt is equivalent to. So let's just pause for a second. Do you need to know that? No. Is it important that you get that specific set of units? No. But the process we used is important. Because in physics 30, if I say to you, what is a Tesla equivalent to, you need to be able to work out what it is in standard units. And I would have to work it out, but there's a set of standard units that it's equal to. A Tesla is the unit of magnetic field. Okay. Anyway, a little bit of an exercise there. Any questions with 
getting that final answer. All right. So, one more thing before we get to some examples. There is this thing in physics which we refer to as efficiency. And efficiency, this is a tricky thing. The basic definition is efficiency is a percentage of work done that's used. That's useful, maybe I should say. So if you take the energy output and this part, which is the energy output, I, I hope that you understand at the end of this lesson that it's the useful energy. You know, if, if I am using a light bulb to heat, not to heat, if I'm using a light bulb to light up a room, then the useful energy is the amount of light energy, right? If I'm using a toaster to make toast, the useful energy is not the light energy, even though there's a bit of light energy, the useful energy is heat, because the heat is what browns the bread to turn it into toast. The energy input is essentially all of the energy used. Yuck. This is all of the energy used. So when I said earlier that an incandescent light bulb is only about 5% light, that means of the 100% used, only 5% goes into lighting my room, which means the efficiency in regards to that is 5%. But if I were stranded in the middle of nowhere in a very cold environment and I didn't have any way to make fire, but I happen to have a battery and a whole bunch of incandescent bulbs that I could use, and I was in an enclosed space, I would, it would heat up the space very quickly. If you've ever stood right next to one of these bulbs, it gets quite warm. You can feel it. Then the percent efficiency in heating my environment would be 95% efficient. It depends on what you're talking about. All right. All right. I think I've set the stage here. Let's do some problems. An elevator and its occupants have a mass of 1,300 kilograms. And the motor lifts the elevator a total distance of 40 meters in 75 seconds. On an exam or in some of the questions you're going to be doing, I would simply ask this. I'm asking you A first to kind of lead you towards B. So A says, what type of energy transfer is made to the elevator and its, and its occupants? So when the motor does work, what kind of energy is it producing? Well, it's producing gravitational potential energy. This is a little bit tricky. It doesn't say in the question that the elevator is moving at a constant speed. And there does have to be some initial acceleration to get it to move. But the change in kinetic energy is negligible. Meaning, I think that's right. Meaning, um, I'm not interested here in the kinetic energy of the elevator. And we can't really answer that in terms of kinetic energy anyway, because we don't have enough information. So, what is the power output? Well, I'm going to force you to not use power equals work over time, even though that's what's on your formula sheet. Whenever you go to your formula sheet and you see that power equals W over T, try to remember you're going to use power equals change in energy over T. It means the same thing. It's just that you don't have multiple W's floating around. So, our formula here is going to be mgh over t. Same thing we've been doing since, well, for a couple of months anyway. Namely, we don't rely on a formula on our formula sheet to answer the question. We rely on a formula on the formula sheet to develop a formula which we can use to answer the question, right? 
I mean, that's what free body diagrams are all about. That's what conservation of energy was all about. And now we can go ahead and put the numbers in. 1,300, 40, and... G, of course, is 9.81 meters per second squared. The height was 40 meters over the time. Did I see 7.5? 75. That is one slow elevator, isn't it? That's, you can hear the motor grinding away as you're going up. That's like a minute and a quarter. But, okay, 75 seconds. Now, I want you to notice that, that the units of the top are kilograms times meters squared per second squared. And there are some physics teachers who prefer to talk about all these units from day one. But my experience has been, let's leave the units out of it. Let's just do the calculations. Now I'm going to start to put units in more often. And in physics 30, almost all the time. Nah, I shouldn't say almost all the time. A lot of the time. Okay. So the top of this is going to be joules, and the bottom is seconds. So it's going to be joules per second, which is the units of power. Grab the calculator. Yours said 75 seconds, didn't it? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. So 6802 joules per second. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's the meaningful answer, joules per second. But we can't run away from the fact that there is a unit of power called a watt. Okay? So what we could do is we could say the power is 6.8 times 10 to the 3 joules per second, which is a watt. Or we could say 6.8 kilowatts. Kilo is 10 to the 3. How many of you have heard of a kilowatt hour? A kilowatt hour is not a unit of power. It's a unit of energy. It's the energy used by one kilowatt in one hour. So when you get charged on an electric bill, I don't know, I, I don't even look at them anymore. I just pay them. You know, you get charged 24 cents per kilowatt hour. You know, and, and maybe I have an electric oven and I'm baking cheesecake and the power of the oven is 2,400 watts, which is 2.4 kilowatts and it takes me an hour to bake that cheesecake, then that means I'm using 2.4 kilowatt hours. And it's costing me 48 cents. You might not think that's very much, but you know there's an electrical meter, right? Have you ever looked at an electrical meter attached to your house? There's a little, usually a little metal disc and it's spinning. Just for kicks, when your parents aren't around, go in your house and turn on everything. Turn on every light, um, if you have a, an electric dryer, turn it on. Um, plug in all your appliances, get the blenders going. Obviously, you're not going to do this. And go outside and you will watch that metal disc just spinning like crazy. All of these things would increase the electrical energy use. And even when they're not on, you're still using electricity in a lot of places. Any questions with 1B? Okay. What is the efficiency of the system if the motor generates 9.4 kilowatts of power to do the specified work? It's an electric motor, and what we're saying is this is the energy to power. Oh, I guess I'll use the word power, the motor. This is the energy that the motor is consuming. It's the total amount of energy used. So percent efficiency is the useful energy. Well, the useful energy, was it 6.8 kilowatts? Over 
9.4 kilowatts and then multiplied by 100. And what this means, I really want to break this down, is that this is 6.8 kilojoules in one second, and this is 9.4 kilojoules in one second. And working with percentage and power, which is joules per second, is a little confusing. So if you like, you can think of it in terms of energy. Of every 9.4 kilojoules of energy the motor is putting into the system, only 6.8 are going into anything useful. So it's a pretty basic calculation. I mean, most people, when they do percent, you would stop here and you would just say 72, right? You know you're going to move the decimal place tw two places. Anyway, it's about 72.3% efficiency. Where's the remaining 28-ish percent going? Where's one place, Noah? Most of it would probably be heat energy. If you've ever, I mean, you don't touch motors, generally speaking, they can get quite hot. But if you had an electric motor, let's say it was a motor that were, you were using to pump water out of a flooded area, and you felt that motor, it would get hot the longer you run it. Um, you cannot run anything with 100% efficiency. You're always going to get heat. Some of that energy, a very little amount, did go into moving in terms of kinetic energy to get it to accelerate, but it's negligible, mostly heat. And some electric motors, how many of you have seen electric motors that throw a lot of sparks? No? An electric drill? Have you ever seen an electric drill and it's, it sparks? in there. Oh, I'll pass the drill around. <laughs> That'll be good for keeping it nice and quiet. Actually, I'm not going to. I will, uh, I will do that later. But when you, there's some contact there. Can you see that? So, I mean, is there a lot of light energy being produced? No. But there is some light energy, and we've learned that light is a form of energy. Mostly heat, though. Okay. Number two, a 1,250 kilogram car. It's a pretty small car, maybe a little Mustang or something. Accelerates from 10 meters per second to 30 meters per second in six seconds. What's the power output of the engine? In other words, in terms of changing the energy of the car, what's the power? Well, power equals change in energy over time. What kind of energy is being used here by the engine? Well, the useful energy is going into kinetic energy of the car. So we're going to take the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy and divide by the time. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with you saying this. And in fact, sometimes we want to think that way because to find the work, we would use force times displacement and not change in energy. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying if you use this formula, remember that this is work, not watts. It's just a matter now of calculating all of this. And some of you might feel more comfortable calculating the change in energy to begin with, and then dividing by the time, I'm just going to show all of my work, no pun intended, here. Okay. 
Notice where, I, I don't think we've ever talked about this. I find that hard to believe. I had to have brought it up somewhere. Do not write the square of 10 meters per second like that. That's not right. That's 10 square meters per second. That's what that is. You need that 10 meters per second in brackets. Is it crucial in high school? No. But post-secondary, these things start to pile up. These little details should pile up in your head. Over, um, I'm sorry, was it six seconds? It was. Thank you. Over six seconds. Again, you're going to get units of joules on the top because a kilogram meter squared per second squared will give you joules. And then it's just a matter of running it through your calculator. So 1 half mv squared minus 1 half mv squared. I'm just squaring 30 and 100. Is that divided by 6? Getting the same number. Okay. So 8.3, I guess we'll go to three, no, two digits. 8.3 times 10 to the 4. Again, I prefer to, as I'm teaching this, say joules per second, but yeah, it is 8.3 times 10 to the 4 watts, as long as you know a watt is a joule per second. Any questions with um, 2A? The engine is 42% efficient in moving the car. What is the power of the engine in horsepower? This is a question, we do a similar calculation in Physics 30 with a different context that people get wrong. You think, well, how could they get it wrong? It's percent. The idea is that that 8.3 times 10 to the 4 joules per second is the output. What many people want to do when they see this is they see that 8.3 times 10 to the 4, they see 42%, and they go, oh, well, i got to find out what 42% of that is. That's wrong. How many of you appreciate that what the question is asking us to find has to be a number bigger than 8.3 times 10 to the 4? Okay. What some people will do is they'll find out what 42% of this is and add it back to that. But that's not how percentages work. 42% efficiency means this is 42% of the total. So let me write that down and give you a brief lesson here in terms of language and mathematics and equations. And I'm not meaning to be condescending. These are things that hopefully you have been taught in previous grades, like elementary school even, but it's easy to forget some details. The word is in mathematics means equals. Sometimes it's so obvious that you don't even think about it. If I say my age is 40, as well as being a liar, I would be telling you my age equals 40. That's what I'm saying. So what this is saying is 8.3 times 10 to the 4 is equal to, now 42%, percent means over 100. Of, in the English language as it relates to math, means times. I don't know if anybody's ever told you that. Of means multiplication. One half of something means you take one half times that thing. So in order to answer this question, bottom line is you have to take this divided by 0.42. You could have as well used the formula, which would say the percentage is equal to the output. Well, that was weird. Is equal to the output. divided by the total energy, which is the engine power.
times 100. And no matter how you cut it, you're going to end up taking, when you cross multiply, this engine power will come up where the 42 is, and then you'll have to divide 8.3 times 10 to the 4 by 42%. I prefer to think of it this way, but let's see what we get. I need to divide this by 0 0.42. This must be the power of the engine. To prove that to you, 42% of this should be that 83,000, right? And it is. So this is our answer. 198 kilowatts. or kilojoules per second, but again, kilowatts is fine. Any questions with B? Now, we are asked to find in a horsepowers, and you know, there are certain units that are not standard units that we just use, miles, feet, pounds. So you were told that a horsepower is 746 watts, okay? I do think it's kind of important that you understand where this comes from. Charles Watt, I don't quite know why he used the numbers he used. Remember, the, the metric system wasn't really standard, not even invented, until certainly within the last 100 years. This is, we're talking about 1800s maybe. So he decided to take an average kind of draft horse or workhorse and talk about what they could do to a 550 pound mass by lifting it one foot in one second. And it turns out that that amount of energy is equal to about 746 watts in terms of power. I shouldn't have said energy, it's power. The average kind of draft workhorse can do about 746 joules of work every second. So that's where that comes from. In order to answer this question now, we simply can go back here and set up a ratio. One horsepower is 746 watts. X horsepower is equal to 198, I'll pull the rest of the decimals up for us, 413. I, I realize there are many of you that understand, you're just going to divide that number by 746. Without having to write a ratio, I think many of you know what to do. It's actually, I think, 745 point something. And there's a, there's a standard horsepower. There's a imperial horsepower. There's different ways to define it. I hope you understand that defining power in terms of what a horse can do is not very definitive, right? Horses are different. So about 266 horsepower. So when you hear somebody say, oh, that, that car's got... 266 horses under the hood. I don't know if people talk like that anymore. That's maybe an old school thing. It's telling you how many horsepower there are. Okay. So about 266 horsepower. All right, we have one more uh, problem to work on, and it's kind of the, the most tricky of the problems we've looked at today. A car of mass 2,000 kilograms is traveling up a hill at a constant speed of 90 kilometers per hour. It's presumable, or we can presume here, that we're going to need to know what that is in meters per second. Have you got it already? Oh, it gives it in meters per second. I guess I should read the question. Is it exactly 25 if you take 90 divided by 3.6? All right, let's not argue about it. Um, so it does work out to exactly 25 meters per second. Okay. 
The force of air resistance which opposes the motion is 450 newtons. The slope of the hill is 6 degrees. You can tell that this is turning into an inclined plane problem. Determine the forward force needed to maintain the car's speed. Well, this question is not about power. I'm going to draw the ramp or the road or whatever you'd like to call it. And I'm going to exaggerate it. Six degrees is pretty difficult to draw. That's obviously greater than six degrees. You know the deal. We treat all objects in physics 20 basically as blocks makes it simple to talk about the forces we're asked to find the forward force needed well this question finding the forward force needed is directly related to that assignment you did last time where we had to push an object up the ramp but I can't remember if it was a constant speed or not but it doesn't matter this forward force which is what we're after I'll call it the applied force, has to be balanced by forces in the opposing direction. Why? Why does this force have to exactly equal all of the forces in the opposite direction? Christina? It's moving at a constant speed. Right, it's moving at a constant speed in a straight line. There's no acceleration. All the forces are balanced. Which, by the way, just to let you know, the question on the exam that asked you to find the period of motion and whether the forces on the object were balanced or not, if it's moving in a circle, it's not balanced. So what are the opposing forces? Well, there is a force of friction. We know there's a force of friction of 450 newtons. If this car were moving, or truck, or whatever it is, were moving on a horizontal surface, then that 450 newtons would be the applied force forward. But there's another force opposing its motion right now. Shannon, do you know? Can you tell me more about this force of gravity? Perfect. It's the parallel component of gravity. And I don't know what that is. It doesn't matter. I suspect that Given the small incline, it may not be that great. It may be greater than the force of friction. It may be less. I don't think that's something we need to worry about. So there is also the force of gravity parallel to the ramp. Well, why don't we calculate that? Let's calculate that, and then we'll have our answer to the question. Because all we would have to do then is add these two opposing forces. So the parallel component of gravity is equal to the actual magnitude of the force of gravity times the sine of the angle. So that's mg sine theta, which is 2,000 kilograms times 9.81. I'm not putting units here because I don't have enough room. That's the only reason. <laughs> sine of 6 degrees, make sure that you are in degree mode. lot bigger than the force of friction. I guess it's quite a massive vehicle, right? Uh, so 2051 so if I were to draw this to scale it'd be something like that. I don't that's not the point, right? The point is you understanding that this force up the ramp has to be equal to the sum of those two forces down the ramp. So the answer to the question is the applied force along the road has a magnitude of whatever that sum is, which is, can I just call it 2,500 newtons? Right, I mean, we're not landing people on Neptune here. It's, that's close enough for what we're talking about. 
And now, and that's pretty straightforward and it has nothing to do with power, but what's the power output of the engine? Well, power is change in energy over time. If you try to solve this problem by talking about the gravitational potential energy of the truck or the car, it becomes very complicated. So as much as I don't like this, we're going to use the concept of work over time. When you use the formula on the left, you're thinking in terms of energy. You're thinking kinetic, potential, spring, all that other stuff. When you use the formula here, you're using the concept of force times distance. And we know that force is 2,500 newtons. I will carry all the decimals in a second, but I'm just going to write 2,500 newtons. But we don't know the distance. And we don't know the time. We don't. We don't know how, you know, it, it could be climbing that hill for five kilometers as it is on the highway heading up to Rogers Pass. Or it could be this little hill that's a driveway. Do you have an idea, Noah? It's traveling at 25 meters per second, so you could just go 25 meters. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tweak that a little bit. You're saying we could just go 25 meters in one second. I'm going to tweak that a little bit because we really don't know if it's 25 meters, do we? We don't. But that's V. So in this particular case, the power is equal to the force times the speed. It's an interesting result. And I know that's what you said, but I really want to make it clear that we are not saying it's traveling for 25 meters. We're saying the ratio of the distance to time is 25 meters per second, so that we can go, just go 25 meters per second. And if you were to break down the units of newtons times meters per second, you would get the units of power. You would get joules per second. So 6.25 i got to add that 450. I need to multiply that by 25, so you get 6.25 times 10 to the 4 watts, or joules per second. 